We're very, very thrilled to have uh, something new, linguistics. Um, uh, Susan Lin is Assistant Professor of Linguistics at UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on phonetics, the study of speech sounds, with an emphasis on individual variation in speech articulation and implications of said variation for speech perception and sound change. Um, before studying linguistics at the University of Michigan, uh, where she received her PhD in 2011, uh, Professor Lynn spent four glorious years. They were really glorious. Very glorious <laughs> years studying math and computer science at Cal, uh, where she received her uh, bachelor's degree in 2002. And in this talk, Professor Lynn will present an overview of the world of ling language research as viewed through the eyes of a linguist. So with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Lynn. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, for that very generous introduction. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, Katie, as well, for uh, inviting me to be your guys' inaugural linguist. Um, I hope I will be the first of many. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to leave this up here just for a moment to uh, emphasize how, how much, how much um, science at Cal, including linguistics, really depends on, um, on the generous contributions of not specifically you, but uh, could be you, and especially if you were to give in the next couple of hours. And so, uh, normally I tell my students to please put away their phones, but if you are using your phone to donate, um, I will allow it. Uh, I'm actually just kidding. I don't really make people put away their phones, but so. Just a moment of levity. Um, so, so again, I wanted to, uh, let, I'm going to stand over here so that I don't block this screen. Uh, so I wanted to say a couple of things here uh, in terms of, well, hmm, yes, let me start over. Um, so I'm really honored to be uh, the first linguist here. And because I'm the first linguist here, I thought sort of my job here would be to, uh, to help tell you guys about this field of linguistics. And hopefully, I can convince you guys that uh, it's something that you guys want to see over and over again. Uh, and more linguists will get to come and explain their wonderful, wonderful research. Um, and so, so the first thing that I really want to do, I want to give an, a very broad overview of some of the things that it is that linguists do. This isn't all of the things that linguists do. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously going to leave out a whole bunch of things. So those of you who are linguists in the crowd, I apologize. Um, I'm going to be focusing on a. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on the kinds of things that I know and the kinds of things that I'm very interested in. But of course, there's much more out there. Um, but instead of starting off with what linguists do, I'm actually going to start off with what linguists don't do, uh, because there are a lot of very common misconceptions about what linguists, who linguists are, and the kinds of work that we do. And so the first thing that many people think that linguists do is to translate languages. And in fact. We don't really do that, or at least we don't do that as linguists. Many of my good friends are uh, both linguists and also language translators, but uh, when we do that, we don't do that as linguists. I do also want to point out that, of course, the term linguist uh, can often, is often used in place of translator, uh, for instance, in the military. Uh, and so this is, where one of, this is one of the places where this misconception comes from. But in the academic setting, normally when we're talking about a linguist, we're not talking about a translator. Linguists don't typically provide accent coaching. Um, although I do want to point out here that, of course, Henry Higgins uh, from My Fair Lady was, in fact, a phonetician. I mean, as, in as far as a fictional character can be um, a phonetician. He was a phonetician, um, and so he, of course, was a linguist, but as, uh, uh, as an accent coach, um, he was not in his role as a phonetician. He was an accent coach at that point. Um, and also, linguists aren't able to you know, lock themselves in a room with a tablet and magically understand alien languages after a couple of hours, uh, like Dr. Daniel Jackson does in Stargate, which is a film, of course, that I absolutely love. But uh, this is factually inaccurate. And this, this kind of thing comes up a lot in science fiction, right? So you have linguists who are able to translate languages because, of course, you need to be able to do that, right? In a, in, in, in a world where you've got a whole bunch of different races and a whole bunch of different alien forms, they need to be able to communicate with each other. So you have to have a linguist somewhere in there, right? Uh, and so, so most science fiction stories get around this by having somebody like Dr. Jackson 
who's able to just magically understand things. But one of the things that I really love about the film Arrival, I don't know how many of you guys have seen this film, one of the things that I absolutely love about the film Arrival is it really does linguistics proud. Uh, and it does linguistics proud because it represents how much work really goes into uh, understanding an alien language in this case. I'll be honest, I haven't actually studied any alien languages personally, but the process that Dr. Banks goes, to, goes through during this movie to try to understand this, uh, this alien language is really similar to the kinds of processes that we go through as linguists when we encounter a new language for the first time. So the first, step that, the first thing that we usually do in these situations is we collect and uh, we analyze primary language data. So we go up to the people who we are studying, the language that we're studying, and we ask them, how do you say this? Or, in some cases, just talk. And I'm just gonna write this all down, right? And so that's one of the first things that we do. Then, once we have this data, we like to try to hypothesize some rules. We try to, we try to say, okay, well, I don't know exactly what's going on here, but maybe it's this, right? And then we, we build these rules, we, we come up with these models that we think might govern how these speakers behave, how, how or in this case, these, um, weird cephalopod creatures, how, how they do their thing, right? Uh, and once we have these models, then we go back. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm popping a little bit, so let me... Sorry. Uh, and then we, we, take, we take our rules and our models and we make new predictions from them, and we go back, we go back to the people and we say, can you do this? And they'll, they'll say yes, they'll say no, in the, case of, uh, in the case of the aliens in Arrival, they'll you know, make a black splotch. Uh, and we'll test and we'll test and we'll test until we have a rule that makes sense. We, until we have a rule that predicts the behavior that we're seeing, right? And so in this way, in this way, linguistics is, is you know, a science, right? We find data, we try to model that data, and then we go back and we test and test and retest and retest. Uh, over and over and over again until we have something that we think might actually model what people do. So, uh, speaking of cephalopods, I want to do a little demo. All right, audience participation time. What is this? This is an eight-legged cephalopod, right? What is the English word for this creature? Octopus. Octopus, right? Great. All right, so we would say one octopus, right? Would anybody say anybody, anything else? No, okay, great. Now what? All right, I've got octopi. Octopods. I've got octopods. Anybody else? Octopuses? Okay, great. So not everybody agrees, right? And this is where things get fun. So how do we know what's correct, right? A lot of times I get emails from students who are like, actually to be honest, more like my family. Oftentimes I get emails from my family and they're like, what is the correct way to do X? Uh, and well, you know, as a linguist, as a scientist, I'm like, well, okay, well let's think about this for a moment. So when you go back and you think about the answer that you gave for what is the plural of octopus, Let's think about what could be the case. Where did we learn what the plural of octopus is? So it could be, it could be that you heard other people say it that way, and so of course, great, I know what the plural of octopus is now, right? Maybe you didn't know what the plural, plural of octopus was and you didn't want to look like a fool, so you looked it up in a dictionary and it said octopi or octopuses, I think, more likely. It could also be the case that you didn't want to bother looking things up in a dictionary, or you know what, sometimes like, you don't have a dictionary with you. So you're like, well, octopus is really similar to the word, the, the, the end of it is really similar to the word bus, and I know that the plural of buses, or bus is buses, and so maybe the plural of octopus is octopuses, right? That's a, uh, the, a process that we call analogy, where we look for something similar and we try to apply the same rule. Maybe, <laughs> someone a long time ago told you it was a thing and you're like, oh, oops. And now you're afraid to do it any other way, right? And maybe when they told you it was that thing, they were like, you know, it has something to do with Latin and like declension and I don't really know, but you know, it's octopi, right? 
And then maybe they're like, actually, it's not Greek. <laughs> and if it's Greek, shouldn't it be Octopodes? <laughs> And then maybe you came to a linguistics lecture where somebody might, to might have told you that actually it doesn't really matter. And so this is the infuriating thing about being a linguist, right? The infuriating, well, <laughs> not the infuriating thing about being a linguist, but the infuriating thing about asking a linguist this question, because we'll turn around and we'll ask you, what does it mean to be correct anyways? When you just wanted to know, <laughs> is it octopi or octopodes or just octopuses? And so, we're not really interested in that. We're much more interested in, what's it even mean to be correct, right? How do we learn these things, and why do we think octopuses is right? Why do we think octopi is right? Why do we have these visceral reactions when somebody tells us it's something else? And so that thing we don't want to call correctness, right? Because everybody has their own idea of what correctness is. We want to call that thing grammaticality. Uh, and and so I want to argue that if science were about knowing things, and of course we all love to know things, right? Most people like to go into science and math because they love to know things. I love to know things. Uh, but if science were really just about looking things up and knowing a thing, right? Linguistics, at least as a science, I mean, we'd be out of business because everybody would be a linguist. And the reason that everybody would be a linguist if linguistics was just about knowing what's correct, right, is that we all kind of are experts in our own variety of our own language. So that's called an idiolect. And so I contend that linguistics isn't about knowing a thing. Linguistics is about asking, right? And once we ask, then we observe. And once we observe, then we can do some things. So I'm going to do another demo right here. So here are two sentences. I've highlighted two words in particular. We'll see why in a moment. Uh, so these sentences, I would say, if I saw these sentences on the street, or if I heard these sentences, um, yes, I did just see, say that. Um, if I saw these sentences written down somewhere, if I heard these somewhere, what do you guys think? These are, these are good, fine English sentences, yeah? yeah? Does anybody have a problem with these sentences? Yeah, right, good. How about this? What if I told you that Sid was an individual who's non-binary uh, uh, non gender conforming? Let me see if I got that right. Yes? Okay. Uh, and their pronoun of preference is they, them. What about that? So if I had these two versions of this sentence, Sid drove themself and Sid drove themselves, now what? What do you guys think? How many of you guys think that Sid drove themselves how many for you, this is grammatical? And how many of you, Sid drove themselves, is grammatical? How many of you are revolting and ready to walk out right now because singular they is not grammatical? And that's fine. That's 100% fine. So for me, personally, this first sentence here is grammatical and the second sentence is not. And when I have a thing that is ungrammatical as a linguist, I'll put a star next to it to say, for me, that's not grammatical. And this is a really important point, that the things that I'm going to put up here on this slide, they're my judgments, they don't have to be yours, right? So you're going to have your own judgments, and some of them will be the same as mine, but some of them won't. These are mine. All right. And when we take all of these judgments and we ask a bunch of other people these judgments and we collect them, then we can start generalizing over lots of different people's collective knowledge, right? And once we have those generalizations, then we can say that maybe we understand a little bit about what's going on in this language. All right. So maybe we make a hypothesis here, right? Maybe we make a hypothesis that uh, because, because Sid is a single person, right? the self here has to agree a number with that, okay? So we've got some amount of number agreement going on here. Um, and we have to, in order to do that, of course, we have to accept that they, them is, uh, is usable in a singular context. Maybe we don't, but uh, if we want to say that this is grammatical, of course, we have to accept that. So how about these sentences, or pairs of sentences? So ask Elena, she knows, right? So this knows here agrees with she and it also agrees with elena how about ask elena and alex they know right so again we have this number agreement here with both they and uh this group noun elena and alex right now how about these <laughs> she, she knows. all right 
So let's suppose, let's suppose uh, we, uh, we hear this sentence, ask, ask Sid, they knows. How about ask Sid, they know? Ah. All right. Who thinks this, the first one is grammatical? Of those of you who are OK with they as um, a singular pronoun, who thinks that this one is grammatical? They knows. All right. Who thinks that this second one is grammatical? They know. I agree with the majority here as well. So I, I look at this and I say to myself, that's weird. <laughs> right? That's weird because on the one hand, in this set of sentences, I'm totally fine with the self version. I'm totally fine with the singular version of this pronoun. In this side, I am not cool at all. Right? I have a gut reaction and it says this sentence is wrong. This agreement is wrong. Right? It's not consistent with my previous hypothesis. So now I have to go back and I have to come up with a new hypothesis and then I have to go back to everybody and say, what about these sentences? And I have to do that over and over and over again. And I'm not a syntactic syntactician, so I'm going to stop here and say, that's weird. <laughs> so this is kind of the first step in doing any sort of linguistic research. It's to document something and to observe it. Right? And once we observe enough of these things, then we can try to make some generalizations. And once we make some generalization, then we either predict a thing and then we make some more observations. It's this whole circle, right? It's this whole circle. And you know, it's really fun and it's exciting. We learn a lot about language in the process. But how do we actually do that, right? So if you're working, for instance, with a language that nobody's heard before, so let's say an alien language, uh, or you know, just a language that nobody has written down yet, uh, as, as, more like, as more often the case, anyways, in my experience, uh, what you do is you go and you talk to people. So unlike, for instance, Daniel Jackson in Stargate, you don't just sit in a room looking at a whole bunch of things and th say to yourself, OK, I know how to say cat, right? You have to go out into the world and you actually ask these people. You like, you know, you bring your you bring your cat and you're like, what do, what do you call this thing? You know, and they're like, that's a cat. Um, and you write that down, right? And so you get these like notebooks full of people's notes. Uh, what we have here actually are some really old field notes. These are some field notes from 1916 uh, of the language Chochenyo. And what you can see over here on the left, I don't know, I don't know if it's large enough here, but what you're seeing here on the left. Is uh, is this person's? Uh, th these are wor English. Uh, these are words in English. So, for instance, this says boy right here. This says third singular feminine. This is maternal grandfather. So, the best that I can figure out is right here. What's going on is they're doing some family and lineage kinds of words. So they're like, what's the word for grandfather? What's the word for paternal grandfather and maternal grandfather? And what they're doing over here is they're collecting all of these notes about what the person that they're speaking to is saying, right? And so we collect a whole bunch of these kinds of notes, uh, and then we can try to make some generalizations. And you'll notice, for instance, here that there's some words, I mean, it's in cursive, so it's hard to read in the first place, right? Uh, but also, you'll notice that there are some things that are definitely weird uh, little symbols, like this little hatchet over the S, this little line underneath the T, and you're like, what do those things mean? Well. When we document languages that we've never heard before, we usually use some kind of a notation system that is somehow universal, right? Because we need to be able to write things down in a way that if a language has a sound that we don't have in English or French or whatever language it is that is your native language, we need to still be able to write it down. We st need to still be able to describe it, right? So phoneticians came up with this thing called the International Phonetic Alphabet. And it's not a unique concept, but the one that won out was the one called the IPA. I have a whole lecture about uh, the IPA uh, that I can tell any of you guys who are interested in later, but uh, I don't have enough time. So in the IPA, what we have essentially is a one-to-one -one correspondence, we believe, between these symbols and different sounds that exist in all of the world's languages. Uh, and some of these symbols will look familiar, right? So we've got a P and a B. Those are P's and B's. Uh, we've got a M here, that's an M. We've got an R here, but that's not actually an R, that's, that's, that's the trill R. And then once we get into the vowels, things get really hinky if you're an English speaker. Uh, so this vowel right here, that, that you and I might call the letter I for, for a phonetician, that's the, that's the sound E. Uh, this thing right here, oops. This thing right here is, this is the sound O. Uh, this sound right here, which we'll feature in a second, is the sound A, right? So now, if we go into a new language and we're like, what's this thing? This. Also an excuse to show you my awesome cat. 
Uh, if we go around and we're like, what's this thing? Then people might tell us, ah, that's a cat, if it's English. If it's German, they might say Katze. If it's uh, Mandarin, they might say Mao. If it's uh, any of these other languages, it might be any of these things, right? And so you can see some similarities between some of the words here, obviously, uh, but, uh, or like here and here, between Thai and Mandarin. And that might tell you something about the lineage of these languages. Uh, but the, the point that I really want to make here, right, is look at all of these funny symbols and look at all the different sounds that exist in all of the different languages. So we need a way to be able to document them, right? So you might ask yourself, well, how have things, oops. I've given it away. You might ask yourself, how have things changed in the last century, right? Because these, these notes were taken in 1916, right? It's, it's like 2019 now, right? Yes. Uh, so it's 2019 now. <laughs> things have probably changed. We have computers and things, right? Um, and it turns out things haven't changed very much. These are some notes uh, courtesy of one of my graduate students, uh, Miriam Lapierre. And this, these are from her, uh, her notes taken in, uh, is that me? That's not me, okay. Uh, taken while she was recording some speech from some speakers of the language Panada, which is in uh, Peruvian Amazonia. These were taken last year. Uh, and what you see here is essentially the same thing that we saw before, right? You see some English words over here, um, and then the presumably Panada equivalents of them. And you'll see that she's actually, <laughs> she's funny, she's, she's, a very, she's, she's very much a stickler for using very precise IPA. Uh, and so instead of those hatchets and stuff like that we saw before, you've got these little tildes over the ahs that, that, that mean that they're nasalized. I won't bore you with the details here, but of course we can come back to this later. And now you might ask yourself, well, okay, what do we do with this, right? It's fine and all to be able to document this. And in fact, it is really important to be able to document all these languages, especially these languages where, you know, you might have like two or 300 speakers, or in some cases, like 50, right? And you think to yourself, well, how is this language going to survive? And the likelihood is it's not. Uh, and so one of the things that we like to do as linguists that we think is really important as linguists is to go around and actually like document these languages before, before they go away. But let's say you're like me and you don't really care. You're just like, okay, well tell me the good stuff. What's the good stuff? Well, oh, right, I included this picture in here because I love this photo. This is Miriam in action. Uh, and she's not actually collecting field notes here. She's collecting airflow data. That's this little device right here. That's why this particular speaker is wearing this mask. Uh, she's collecting airflow data for this articulation study that she and I are doing. I just love this. Anyways. So what is the good stuff then? So the good stuff to me uh, means questions like what speech sounds are available to people or uh, how are those sounds put together into, into things, or how are those sounds put together? What can we do with these sounds and what can't we do with these sounds, right? And so these things fall under uh, phonetics and phonology. We've got questions in morphology like how do we make words? Languages do this very differently, right? And so we need to be able to know how, to, how that happens. We also need to know how to make sentences. If we didn't have sentences and phrases and paragraphs, you know, how would we, how would you know what I am saying right now? You might want to know how meaning is derived because that can be very, very different uh, for different languages. And also how speakers actually use the language that they have available to them varies quite a lot from language to language, but also community to community within the same uh, language speech. So. One of the things that we notice over and over and over again is that there's lots of variations. So there's variation not just uh, for a s single person speaking, like this, the word that I say right now, the same word if I say it five minutes from now, it's going to be different. Uh, but we think, anyways, that we can generalize over a lot, of, a lot of different speakers. So we can collect all of this data and we generalize over this data to describe what we might call a typical, quote, grammar for this language. So when you see on the bookshelf like a grammar of Chechenyo, that's what that is. That is, these are the things that most of the people who speak this language seem to do. Now here's where I think it gets really cool. We can also try to generalize over all of the known languages, right? So we can document a whole bunch of languages. We can come up with, you know, for instance, what speech sounds are available, and then we can say, okay, if we look at all the languages in the world, what do people do? What, language, what do languages do? How do they pattern? Because languages are different, right? But when we look at languages as a whole, we notice a lot of really interesting things. So 
Uh, if you go into the UCLA Phonological Segment Inventory Database, also known as UPSID, uh, you can find how many languages in the world have, for instance, the sound P. It turns out it's almost 90%. So almost 90% of the world's languages have a P in them. Almost 100% actually of languages have a K in them. And then uh, B, Ds, and Gs are a little bit lower, right? And so you can notice some patterns. I like to actually present this data like this because it shows off not just that P, Ts, and Ks are more common than B, D, and, B, Ds, and Gs, but also that you have this, uh, you have this increase uh, over place of articulation. In other words, uh, the farther back you are in the mouth when you make these sounds, uh, the more common that sound is for the voiceless sounds, but for the voice BDs and Gs, you have exactly the opposite pattern, and that's pretty interesting, right? So, so what we can do with some of the stuff is we can do a little bit of math, right? So my background's in math. I always love when I get to put some numbers on the screen. Uh, so we can do some math, and we can learn that there are some asymmetries in uh, in the languages of the world. So, for instance, I've got I put all my languages having K up here. That's 97. That's like almost all of them. I know. It's not to scale. Sorry. Um, if I put it to scale, you guys wouldn't really be able to see anything, right? So 90% of all the languages in the world have a K. 63% of all the languages in the world have a G, right? And then if you look at all of, this, all of this white space right here, those are all the languages that don't have a K or a G. That's 1%. Like I said, not to scale. So that means that the rest of this, right, the rest of this, the languages that have either a G or a K is 99%. And then I can also do this other math, where uh, this other arithmetic where I determine that the number of languages, the, the percentage, of, percentage of languages that have only a G, that's two. Therefore, the, uh, the percentage of languages that have both a K and a G, that's 61. And the languages that have a K only, that's 36%. Okay, all of this is to get to this point right here. So if a language has a K, this is the implication part. If a language has a K, that means it has a 63% chance of also having a G. That's pretty good odds. I'd probably bet on it, but I'd rather bet on this, right? If a language has a G, it's almost certainly gonna have a K, right? There's like one or two languages where that's not the case, but almost certainly that thing is gonna have a K. And now, if you love languages, you're like, oh, this is really cool. But if you're a linguist, you're like, why? Right? You're like, this is weird. So we make these kinds of observations, and then we make some predictions. We think to ourselves, why might this be the case? Right? So let's say we have this observation that Ks are more common cross-linguistically than Gs are. Right? And we might ask ourselves, why is this the case? So one hypothesis is that maybe Ks are just easier to make than Gs. Uh, maybe they're not easier to make than G's, but maybe they're easier to hear. Maybe they're louder or something like that. And so like, I don't know, they carry over the planes better. And so we can make these sorts of observations and we can ask these questions and we can come up with these experiments to try to test our theories, right? So if I think that K's are easier to hear than G's are, I'm gonna make a whole bunch of series of K's and G's and I'm going to bring some people into the lab and I'm gonna say, listen to these. And they'll listen to them and they'll press some, you know, press some buttons on a keyboard and I'll get some data, right? What are some other kinds of questions that I might ask though? Because I mean, you know, maybe you guys don't find this as riveting as I do. We can ask questions like, you know, when we hear a word, do we process them from left to right? Do we hear each individual segment and then say, ah, that's the word cat because it has a k and an a and a t. Uh, or do we actually just hear the whole word like by itself, right? Do we not process it linearly? Does it just come as a chunk? We can ask questions about uh, different languages. So do different, language, do different uh, language speakers perceive sounds differently? The answer is yes. We can ask another similar question. Do bilingual children actually learn their grammars, learn their languages later than monolingual children? The answer is no, but it's complicated. We can ask what other things that are not maybe in the, thing, not maybe in the world of linguistics uh, what other factors might influence how we process language, right? And so this is the thing that I'm going to be talking about a lot towards the end. Um, and we can also ask what parts of the brain are used during language processing. So we can actually like put people in MRIs and other kinds of machines and we can watch their brains work as they listen to speech or as they even produce speech. And we can ask, for instance, are those parts of the brain that are used during language processing, are they connected to the parts of the brain that are used during speech? Right? So we, we think that like, it's important 
for an individual person to be able to link speech processing and speech production, right? Because those two things seem like they should be two sides of the same coin, right? But are they in fact? We can try to get some empirical data to show one way or another. So, so for, for most of the rest of the talk here, I'm gonna focus on speech perception. Uh, as a phonetician, I'm really interested in sounds, of course. And so, you know, as, uh, and so because of my interest in, my interest in sounds, I, I apologize to any people who are really interested in syntax and stuff like that. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that very much today. Uh, I am gonna talk instead about speech, and in particular speech perception, because I, we can do some pretty cool demos here. So one of the things that we start off with whenever we do a study in speech perception is this idea that there's lots of variation when we speak, right? I know the linguists in the crowd are, crowds are nodding, right? Uh, but what do we mean by that? So just like there was a whole bunch of variation here when we were talking about grammaticality, there's a lot of variation when, when we talk about actual speech. So the way that I speak is different from the way that any of you guys speak. Uh, my vowels are different from your vowels. And somehow, right, somehow listening to speech isn't typically chaos. Right? Most of the time, we get the point across. And so this is, the, this is the fundamental question that's at the core of most research in speech production, is, is why? Right? If we acknowledge that there's all of this variation, how, how do people do this monumental task of even understanding the words that a person is saying? So, hence the title of this talk. So, just like with grammaticality, just like, just like we all had a very visceral reaction to, uh, to what was it, they knows, right? Just like most of us were like, ugh, that's wrong. Uh, people have a really strong intuition about speech, too. So not just words, but also sounds. So I'm going to do a little demo right here. And what I want you to do is, uh, what I want you to do in this demo is pay attention to whether you're hearing a K or a G. No tricks here. Okay. And I forgot my uh, speakers today, so I'm going to have to do this janky thing. All right. So I've got a word here. I'm going to see if this. Can you guys hear this? Oh. We're getting a little feedback. Kid. Is that working okay? Kid. Can you guys hear in the back? Ish? All right. Sorry. Kid. Point it away this way. This way. Thank you. Okay. K or G? Okay. okay, great. And you can see this on the screen, right? Well, <laughs> if you know what you're looking for, you can see it very plainly on the screen. So this is the audio file. Uh, for the sound we just heard. Kid. And this bit right here, this bit is the bit that tells us that this is a K. So, what happens if I delete it? What are you going to hear? Kid. Kid. Do we still hear a K? No. no. What do we hear now? Kid. You, oh, you hear Kid? Maybe I deleted too much. Kid. Let's do this instead. Kid. Kid. Gee, yeah, great. All I did was I just removed a bit of stuff, right? Okay. Let me know when you're going to go back to. I'm going to turn this off now for a sec, because this is an audio only portion. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play you a sequence of, those, of that G, of that kid to that gid, all right? And what I want you guys to do, there's going to be five of them all together. Five of them all together. So I, what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to remember at what point, which sound, which sound did you suddenly go from hearing a G to a K? All right? So hopefully this is loud enough. Here's the first one. Kid. Number two. Kid. Three. Kid. Four. Kid. And five. Kid. Yes. Oh. I <laughs> see. Great. Okay. Did every did everybody what we call quote cross over? No. <laughs> you continue to hear G the whole time, or continue to hear K the whole time? Okay. 
Now, not everybody will do this. Most people will. OK, so who crossed over at 1? Or who immediately heard uh, K? All right. Who started to hear K at number 2? 3? Ah, that's what I thought. 4. <laughs> I see you. OK. So, is this still on? OK, good. So when we do a lot of these kinds of tasks, what we find is, we find, of course, that there's a lot of variation, because guess what? Phonetics is all about variation. Uh, but what we can, what we can say is uh, that most people do a thing, and if we pull a whole bunch of people, we'll see something like this. So what am I looking at here? I'm looking at those five stimuli that I just played you, one, two, three, four, and five. And this is, uh, this is data pulled from a class of undergraduates back in 2016. And what we see is virtually none of them thought the very first one was a K, and virtually all of them thought that the last two was a G. But we have a little bit of variation in the middle, but not too much, right? So we have this nice little S curve. I meant the opposite. I meant the opposite, yes. Uh, <laughs> virtually everybody thought it was a G over here and a K up here, thank you. Uh, yes? I kept hearing a D. Ah, well, great. So that's just a bad, that's just a bad, uh, you thought it was I a... I heard kid. Oh, we are talking, sorry, about the first sound. Oh. So then you heard it as a K. Kid. Kid. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 that was my bad. I apologize. I did not, uh, I wasn't clear enough about the thing that we were listening for. My apologies. Uh, so we have this kind of S-shaped curve right here that tells us that most people agree, and the place where they cross over is somewhere between uh, number two and number three. So most people thought that number two was a, was a G, and most people thought that number three was a K. Okay. Let's hear another series. So I'm going to take those same exact Ks, and I'm going to now put them in front of another sequence of sounds, and I'm going to ask you the same question. Are you hearing a G or a K? at the beginning of the word. So, different word. This word sounds like this. Gift. Everybody hear that? Yeah. Great. Everybody got a G on that? Most people got a G on that? Great. That's the intent. Phew. All right, so that's the first one. Number two. Gift. Three. Gift. Four. Gift. Five. Gift. Okay, so the question now is, where did you cross over? One, two, three. Remember, this is where most of you guys crossed over last time. Three, four, ah, five. I took the same exact bit of the K, right? The, the thing that's the K, and I put it in front of a different thing, and all of a sudden, we get a different thing. We get a different sense, right? We hear it differently. And you guys totally agreed with my Intro to Phonetics class. Uh, so they felt the same. They felt that it was earlier, you cross over earlier when it's the kid versus when it's the gift. And the reason for that, does anybody have an idea what the reason for that might be? We know the word. We know that gift is a word. We know that kid is a word. And that's exactly what we think is going on here. We think that what's going on here uh, is that we, because we're speakers of English, we know these words. And we're always trying to hear words, right? And because we're always trying to hear words, it's harder for us to hear gift than it is to, to hear gift. And it's harder for us to hear the word, the non-word gid, than it is to hear the word kid. So that's what's going on here. Same exact stimulus, and yet somehow it's different. I've got another uh, demo here that I'm not going to do because I think I'm going to run out of time if I do. Uh, but uh, we can talk about this after. Uh, if you guys are interested in this, we can do this demo afterwards if we have time. The upshot of this demo is that if you play the same exact series of sounds that are a continuum from S, the sound S, to S, the sound of SH, you'll find that where people cross over now actually depends on the gender of the speaker. Or at least I should say the perceived gender of the speaker, because you don't know you don't know them. 
Uh, and so in addition to things like lexical knowledge, so the knowledge that something is or isn't a word, the knowledge that the person who you're listening to is a man or a woman, that also affects how you hear things. So now we're kind of getting out of what we think might be uh, linguistic. Now we're getting into things that are sort of extra linguistic, or as many of my students argue, still linguistics. Okay, so so far we've all been doing just audio stuff. How about visual stuff, right? So I don't know how many of you guys, oops, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with this video. I love this video. Um, so what I want you guys to do, well, actually just watch it because they do a good job of it. And you gotta put this up here. Have a look at this. What do you hear? What do you guys hear? Ba. Ba. A B, right? Yeah. Yay. Ba. 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 But look what ba. happens ba. when we change the picture. Ba. 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 What do you guys hear now? Ba. Some of you guys might still hear, how many of you guys still hear a B? Okay, those of you who don't hear a B, what do you hear now? A V, right? Well, let me go back just a little bit. An F, oh, an F, okay. An F or a V, they're very similar, it turns out. Uh, so we'll accept either of them. But let's go back and listen, so I'm gonna turn this off again. Let's go back and we'll listen just to the audio, so you can't see it anymore. When we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. It's the same exact thing. Is that still a B? Yes. Yeah, right? So what's going on there? I heard somebody, somebody say over here about changing the picture, right? What's going on there? We're lip reading. Well, yeah, so, yes, exactly. We're lip reading a little bit, right? But what's, the, what's, the, what's going on is we're, we're taking visual cues, right? And we're trying to integrate it with the audio cues. And we're having this weird moment where we're like, oh, that doesn't work, right? You guys astutely noticed that the thing that you guys actually heard wound up being what you're seeing on the lips, right? Let's see another example. I know, she's really cute. So this is my friend Kevin's daughter, Nora. Uh, and what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna do the reverse. So we're not gonna see it. You guys are just gonna hear it. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. All right, what you guys hear? Ba, ba, black sheep, yeah. <laughs> uh, most of us hear a B. Anybody hear anything different? Hmm. All right. So now let's watch it. Ready? Yeah. Okay. You guys get D on that? Yeah. All right. I know. It's pretty incredible how this works. So not only do we have this effect, which we can attribute to McGurk and McDonald, you'll hear it more likely, you'll hear it more often as the McGurk effect, but in fact, there were two authors on that paper. Uh, and as we just discovered, it's really robust, right? It doesn't just work for that one specific video, it also works if we do it with a kid, and we've tried this with all kinds of different, uh, we've tried this with all kinds of different people, uh, so it doesn't seem to matter who the person is, as long as you have this sort of visual mismatch between what you're seeing and what you're hearing, you do some kind of weird synthesis in your head and you hear something different, right? Okay, so let me summarize uh, very briefly in the interim. What are some of the things that we know that affect how you hear speech? Well, obviously what the sound is affects how you hear it, right? But also things like your language proficiency, whether it's your native language or not, right? That, that matters because uh, because you know, if you're not as if you're not as fluent in the language, you're going to hear things differently. But also because if you don't know the words in the language, you're going to hear those differently as well. Uh, we know that the vocal characteristics of the speaker matters, right? If the if the person is male or female, or if the person is tall or short, if the person is a child or an adult, all of those things matter. Uh, we've now just discovered that visual information matters too, right? So all of these things seem to matter. Now, I'm here representing linguistics, which 
is, at least at Berkeley, considered a social science. So I have to ask a question. What about socio-indexical information? What's that? So that's information like, uh, well, so gender, for instance, falls under that category, but also things like race, right? So, oh, sorry, that was the wrong introduction. Uh, but also things like age, right? Age is another, uh, is another uh, kind of socio-indexical information. So, uh, oops, I've gone too far. I've given it away, but let's do it ourselves anyways. So let's take the same video and you're gonna hear something a little bit different this time. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. So, what did we hear? Did we hear ba? Yes. Yeah. We heard S, okay. We heard, so, so some people heard da still? Great. A D, yeah, okay. So the same, so the same effect as you got with the, with the child with the child voice, right? Uh, how many of you guys didn't do anything? How many of you guys just heard ba, the B? That's what, that's what happens with me. How many of you guys heard something else altogether? So an S. An F, who knows, right? Lots of different things. And so when we have this kind of mismatch, this sort of identity mismatch, all kinds of crazy things happen. So we can break this effect. We can break this effect when the socio-indexical information of the speaker doesn't match what we, what we see, right? And this is why, oh, I didn't, oh, okay, here we go. I'm not talking about Will Smith's wife, like this young girl. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is Langston from Regal View. All right, so that was from the movie Sorry to Bother You. And that's why that's funny, right? Because we've got this person on the screen who we don't associate with the voice. It's funny but it's also kind of problematic. All right, actually, so. Actually, was it a different person that spoke? Oh yes, it was in fact a different actor, yeah. So, uh, let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you about a, I'm gonna tell you about a study uh, right now that isn't actually a linguistic study. It's a study, uh, it's, a, it's a higher education study. And so back in the early 90s, Donald Rubin uh, was really concerned about why it was that the students in, in the university, this was a University of Michigan, I think it was MSU and not, University of Michigan, uh, go blue. Uh, so he was really concerned about why it was that people were having a really hard time learning from, from their TAs. So he, he, he conducted a little study. So he recorded a bunch of short lectures, so like 10, 15 minute lectures, um, and these lectures were all read by a native speaker of English. So, you know, he just grabbed somebody off the street and was like, well, not really, probably from his lab. That's how these things work. Uh, and he said, read these things. So he read this, uh, so they read these short lectures, and then he paired these lectures with a photograph of an Asian person or a Caucasian person. And he played these for English-speaking Caucasian students, and he asked them, okay, well, what did you guys think? You know, how, how, was, uh, how, was, the how was the lecturer? Did you, get, did you understand what they were saying? And they were also uh, quizzed on the contents of the lecture because, of course, his objective here is how do we make sure that people understand? How do, how do we make sure that people learn things, right? And so here's what he found. He found lots of other things, but we're just going to focus on this. So he found that the perceived ethnicity when the, uh, when the students were showed the Asian face was higher than when they were showed the Caucasian face. I mean, that, that seems fine, right? That seems fine. You show it, you, you're, you're a Caucasian student and you're shown uh, a, an image of a Caucasian person and an image of an, an Asian person. You're like, okay, the Asian person's more, more ethnic. I, I'm not even mad about that. It's more ethnic. More ethnic. So I'm not, I'm not even mad about that, honestly, right? <laughs> then he was like, how was their accent? Remember, these were all the same exact audio read by a native speaker of English. So he was like, how'd they sound? Did you understand them? Guess what? No. 
The Asian face condition was rated as having a higher accent than the Caucasian face condition, right? Same voice, different face. And then, when he tested them on their understanding of the material, when the speaker was Asian, or when the speaker was thought to be Asian, they did worse. Now, you're like, okay, come on, Susan, this was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, God. This was 30 years ago, and, like, I mean, this was in Michigan, right? <laughs> Fair. So, 30 years later, I'm in grad school. My good friend Kevin, the person who showed you the, uh, the person whose daughter was in the video that you just saw, um, decided that he was like, okay, I want to test this again. I want to see if this is still true. So, he, instead of having lectures, he had sentences that were read by a native speaker of English, me. Uh, and then he paired these with uh, photographs of an Asian or Caucasian talker. Uh, and instead of just playing them to Caucasian students, he also played them to Asian American students. And so when he played them to Caucasian students, he got exactly the same thing that Ruben found. Right? You're like, oh, okay. Still in Michigan, though. But when he played them to the Asian American students, something really interesting happened. Oh, right, and sorry, the other thing that I forgot to mention is, in addition to the English context, this is very important, he also recorded a native speaker of Mandarin who has a very thick accent. And now, when he put the Mandarin voice with the Asian and Caucasian talkers and played it to both the Caucasian and Asian American populations, something really cool happens. And the really cool thing that happens is that it turns out that when a speaker is more experienced, so when a speaker is Asian American, or sorry, when the listener is Asian American, and therefore are more experienced with uh, Mandarin and Chinese accented speech, they actually do better when the face is Asian, that's the darker bars, than when the face is Caucasian. So this effect gets flipped, right? When the speaker is less experienced, so the Caucasian, they still have this effect, but it's, uh, they still have this effect, but it's a little bit smaller. And also you notice that the Caucasian face and the silhouette face go together. I don't have enough time to talk about that, sorry. So when, we, when, we pair, when he pairs the Mandarin voice with the Asian face, we get exactly the opposite. So there's something actually else going about this. So I mean, do, I, do I get to say that we've solved racism? No, I don't think we've got, I get to say that. But I think what I get to say is, we know now that this effect isn't necessarily about racism, right? This isn't necessarily about race, but it's something about that mismatch, right? Remember that mismatch that we saw before between what we saw and what we heard? It goes deeper than just this individual sounds. It actually goes into something about what we expect this person to sound like, right? And that goes beyond just age or gender. That also goes to things like race. And that's why, sorry to bother you, it's funny but also scary. Also, I just want to point out that um, these data were collected, guess where? Right here, because guess what we have lots of here? Yeah. Asian Americans who are experienced with manner and accented speech. Okay, so, speech perception. We've solved, we've solved speech perception, right? We haven't really. So here are all the things that we've talked about already that we know affect uh, how people perceive speech. We're also discovering that the auditory abilities of the listener affect how we perceive speech. Now, many of you guys might be thinking, well, obviously, but I'm not just talking about like, whether or not you can hear. I'm also talking about whether you hear, whether you hear really closely, uh, really, really closely, <laughs> whether you hear tones that are really close together or not, whether you, can, uh, whether you can hear those apart. That also affects how you perceive speech. The age of the person who is talking or the age of the person who is listening that has a huge effect on how we hear things. We're also discovering really weird things that we never expected, like personality traits. People who are empathetic or display empathy uh, hear things differently than people who don't. People who are extroverted sometimes hear things differently than people who are introverted. People who are on the spectrum hear things differently than people who are less so. Obviously, how much you've had to drink or smoke or whatever has an effect as well. Um, and also some really interesting stuff that I've just recently been hearing about is our reception of a talker's humanity. In other words, whether the, thing, whether the voice we are hearing is a human or whether it's a computer, that affects how we hear it as well. 
right? So all of these things seem to have an, have an impact on how we perceive speech. And rather than just saying that every single one of these things has an impact, I'm going to actually summarize this by saying that what we perceive when we listen to speech is a product, at least in some part, of, uh, of our current environment, so what we're hearing right now, and also what we've experienced in the past, right? And so I want to take a moment now to highlight some of the research that is ongoing in our lab right now. Uh, so this is Alice Shen. She's one of our graduate students. Uh, she's finishing her dissertation right now, which is really cool. It's on uh, subphonemic cues. So these are like really tiny differences in sound and uh, how it is that Mandarin English bilinguals use those cues in perception uh, to anticipate or fail to anticipate this thing that we call code switching. Uh, this is Rexit, and he is, he's been doing this really interesting field work in Thailand uh, with this endangered language called Kui uh, that has uh, the younger speakers have all this contact with the Thai-speaking people in the, in the area and the older speakers don't. And so one of the things that he is studying, he's, he's studying how the perception of this contrast in the language called voice quality, so the difference between a breathy, like, like um, you know, happy birthday, Mr. President. Uh, and modal voice, the voice that I'm using right now, ha that contrast right there is actually phonemic in some languages, so it actually makes a difference in meaning. And so he's testing how the perception of that voice quality difference and tone, so pitch, uh, depend, uh, is different in the monolingual Kui speakers and the bilingual Kui Thai speakers that have a lot of contact with these Thai populations. Uh, Miriam, who you saw earlier, uh, she and I are doing this work with the indigenous peoples of uh, Peruvian Amazonia on um, what the differences are between how they perceive nasal stop sequences and how English speakers perceive nasal stop sequences because it turns out that the Panama speakers have a whole lot of them and they're really weird. Uh, Emily, who's right there. Thanks for coming tonight, Emily. <laughs> Emily is doing some really fabulous work uh, for uh, for her qualifying paper on how listeners integrate the, their knowledge of both the syntactic, so the sentences, uh, and the phonetics, so the sounds, those differences in different dialects. Uh, so if you know that somebody is, if you know that somebody is a different race than you, then you, you might integrate part of that into, into uh, how you perceive their speech. Well, what if the only information you have is actually the sentences that they're saying? So how does that come into play? How does that get bootstrapped into speech perception. Uh, Eric, another one of my graduate students, is working on uh, what computational models best predict how it is that listeners do this in the first place, right? Because one of the things that we, one of the things that I said here was there's this whole list of things that affect how people perceive speech, right? And so he's working on computational models to try to understand how can we actually predict when you have all of this information, right? Because normally we study one thing at a time. So he's saying, well, we have all this information, and a lot of it is conflicting sometimes. So how do we combine all of that together? Uh, and then I also wanted to highlight a, one of the undergraduates that I'm working with right now. She's writing a, an undergraduate thesis on whether her native dialect of Bostonian English, um, whether speakers of that dialect actually hear ours differently than speakers of general American English, Californian speakers? The answer is yes. <laughs> but you know, her study is a little bit more uh, nuanced than simply yes. She's trying to understand how and why. Um, so these are just some, of the, just some of the speech perception studies that are going on in the Fawn Lab. But this is not to, not, to, uh, not to speak on you know, the many other kinds of research that we're doing in the lab. I just wanted to highlight these because this is what we've been talking about so far. Um, but not only is that not just what we're, not only is that only a sliver of what we're doing in uh, the phonetics lab, uh, sorry, the FUD lab, it's also, you know, the, the phonetics portion of what we do in the department is, is only a very tiny sliver of what we do as a department as a whole. So this thing that I put up here before that, you know, how we perceive speech depends on our environment and our experiences, you know, that's not just for speech. That also goes for language in general. So the way that we process sentences, the way that we process meaning, all of that depends on our environment and our experiences, right? And so here are, some, here are some questions that other linguists have asked uh, recently. I pulled this from the um, recent, uh, recently published things. So does an individual's vocal tract uh, influence their production of speech? Uh, this was a dissertation 
Um, this is dissertation work that a former student of mine, Sarah Bax, did. The answer is yes, but it's complicated. Most of the answers are something, but it's complicated. Uh, how do word forms interrupt speech sounds? How is definiteness, definiteness conveyed in a language that doesn't have definiteness? I shouldn't say it doesn't have definiteness. It doesn't have a definite article like a, or sorry, the in this case, the or this. Uh, how does the contents of an individual's lexicon, so the words that they know, how does that affect how they process uh, language? And what methods for language revitalization, right? To go back to one of the very first things that we talked about, right? One of the very first things that we do when we encounter language is we say, do we know this language already? And if we don't know this language, let me hurry and get my notebook so that we can start recording it right away, right? And, so, and one of the things that's really exciting about the day and uh, the, the the day and time that we live in now, the time that we live in now, is that we have all of these language revitalization efforts going on as well. So instead of saying, oh no, this language is dying out, how sad, right? Many of us in the department, I shouldn't say us because I am unfortunately not one of these really awesome people. <laughs> Many people in, in our department are also asking the question, how can we not say, well, let's just document everything really fast before you all die. How do we also say, how do we get the community involved so that we can make this language alive again, right? Uh, and then of course, what social factors influence not just how speech perception works, but also how languages change, right? And that's one of the things that we're all really interested in as linguists, how languages change. So, here's where I could say, do you wanna get involved? <laughs> If you want to get involved, you have, I think, one hour to donate. <laughs> That's not true. We'll take your donations anytime. But if you donate, your money will support the student research. All of the student research that I talked about before is supported by this in two ways. One, by direct contribution. So by directly, uh, by directly paying the students research fees like uh, recruiting subjects or running analyses, but also by virtue of a program that we have in the department called uh, the Linguistic Apprenticeship, sorry, Linguistic Apprenticeship Research, research re thank you. <laughs> linguistic Research apprentice Apprenticeship Practicum. We're linguists, we like long words. Basically, it's, a, it's an official way to get uh, undergraduates involved in our graduate students' research. Um, and every single one of the, every single one of the graduate students that I featured there has employed an LRAP at some point during, uh, during that process, and we couldn't have done that research without their help. Your, research, uh, your, your funds would also help us run our labs, the Fawn Lab and the Language and Cognition Lab, as just, just as an example, but also it helps us support the California Language Archive and the Survey of California and Other Indian Languages. So the uh, really old field notes that I showed you earlier, these are collected in the uh, SCOIL, I think, is the, is the acronym. Uh, and so that's one of the big things that we, that's one of the, the foundations of, uh, of our department is collecting and maintaining this archive. It's one, of the, it's one of the really important things that we do. If you don't have money to donate, that's totally fine. I don't really have very much money to donate either. You can visit us. Please come and visit us. You can visit us by coming to our colloquia, which are open to the public. If you're interested in our colloquia, you can email linginfo ling at berkeley.edu to request to be joined, uh, to request to be added to the list. You can also just email me if you forget this and that's fine. You can come to our Cal Day open house. That's in uh, just over a month. Uh, no, exactly one month, less than one month. It happens on a Saturday, so that's why it's weird. Uh, so if you come to 52 Dwinell, sorry, it's in Dwinell, uh, but if you come to 52 Dwinell, that's where we do our work. We have an open house. I'd love to talk to any of you guys about any of your questions about linguistics at that point as well. Uh, that's on the 13th. We'll be there all day. I think, well, from eight to five or something like that. And if you want to participate, you can sign up to be a member of our participant pool by going to this. Uh, I, I had to shorten it to this. If any of you guys are interested, you can also email me and I will send you this link as well. Uh, and we'll update, we'll, we'll let you guys know, we'll email you whenever we've got a new study uh, and you can see whether you qualify to participate or not. Uh, and 
with that, I just want to say thank you guys so much for inviting me to be here and to tell you guys about some of the work that we do uh, in our department. And I don't know how long we have, but I assume that there's time for questions? Yeah, we have time for questions. All right. Take a bunch of questions. Take a bunch of questions. 15, 20 minutes. 15 to 20 minutes. All right. Yes, sir. Do you ever do any uh, audiograms on the people you're going to use to listen to <laughs> what they're saying? So you have some? So personally, uh, I would show you that my biggest significant hearing loss is in the frequency range of most women. So if I was listening to one of your female speakers, uh. I couldn't hear her even with my highly technical hearing aids. So the question is, do we do audiograms or do we test our participants' hearing uh, when we do these kinds of perception tests? Uh, and the answer is, uh, the answer is we don't typically, but absolutely that is something that happens, especially when we're working with a population who uh, is likely to have some amount of hearing loss, whether it's due to age or uh, ear infections or other other factors like that. Absolutely for some questions it is vital that we know um, how, how a person hears um, and what their auditory capabilities are. Um, we don't currently run any studies where, uh, where we do that and it's not because it doesn't matter, it's simply because uh, most of our studies of course are run on, guess what, 18 to 24 year old college students. <laughs> Well, and for that never listen to rock, heavy rock. Well, that's, I mean, we're catching them usually before they lose their hearing, so. Um, but that's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. So um, if you're interested in participating in things, but you think that your hearing loss might prevent you from, from that, that's okay. We'll just email you and you can, you know, look at the thing and ask questions and decide not to, for instance. I, was, I see a hand over there and a hand over there. So you first, then you. Okay, so the question I think is, uh, what about, so we know that people sound different, but, but what about people who sound louder or quieter than other people? Is that something that's part of a dialect or is that something, something else? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. And of course, I too have made some general observations, um, usually at like a cafe or something like that where I'm trying to work and I'm thinking to myself, hmm these Chinese people really need to be more quiet. Um, and I'll be honest, I don't actually know of any studies that have, have, uh, have measured that. My guess would be that if, if it is measurably, if, if it is true, if we can measure this, that it would wind up being something cultural rather than something to do with that specific dialect. Um, but it is a really, it's, an, it's certainly an intriguing idea that Depending on the environment, again, depending on the environment that you're in, you may need to be louder uh, in order to be heard, in order to be perceived. So that's a really interesting idea. But I don't know offhand of any specific studies that have, uh, that have looked at that. There was a hand over here. Yes? Yes. Uh, yes, so one of the things that you may have noticed is most of the stuff that I talked about here is really about, uh, is really about the spoken language. And so most linguists, the vast majority of linguists study spoken language, but there's a really, uh, there's a really interesting set of research on, um, on basically word recognition. And that's where a lot of this dyslexia stuff comes in, into play. And so uh, what is a word that you, you would be looking for though? I mean. Yes. So the question is, do, do linguists communicate with people who study dyslexia? And unfortunately, the answer is generally not. Um, and it's not because we're not interested in similar things. It's, it's largely because the people who hire us are interested in different things. So the people who hire, the people who hire 
uh, dyslexia researchers uh, typically are involved in speech technology or uh, clinical work, whereas the people who hire linguists tend to be universities um, and, well, yeah, universities. <laughs> <laughs> And there are some places where, there are definitely some places where, uh, where there's cross-pollination. And in fact, um, so I did my, I did a postdoc for a couple of years in Sydney where one of my office mates was a research in dyslexia and the, the specific work that he was doing was actually on uh, what happens with speakers of Chinese languages because their orthography, of course, is, uh, is graphemic rather than, uh, rather than, sorry, is pictorial rather than graphemic, right? And so he's like, well, there are dyslexics in China as well, so what, how do they do what they do? Uh, so he and I had lots of really interesting conversations. Of course, you know, what I do and what he does are very different from each other, and so we didn't wind up ever working together, but uh, we had lots of interesting conversations. And I could imagine if I had stayed there longer that we might have tried to do something together. But, uh, so the sad answer to the question is we don't really, we don't really communicate very much, um, but it's not for a lack of interest or respect, it's mostly a lack of opportunity. Yes? Uh, what about non-human <laughs> like uh, for animals? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that still in the realm of linguists? Or uh, is there any work being done in cow? That's a fantastic question. So the question is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, what about non-human communication? Well, I'm going to use the word communication here because the way that I was taught anyways was that non-human communication is not language and is therefore not something that linguists, speak, uh, linguists study. Uh, I, was taught this as a, I, I, I was taught this very strict though. And so personally, I think it's really fascinating research. Um, but it is not something that I study and is not, to my knowledge, anything that anybody in our department studies. Um, there is some research happening in psychology and in neuroimaging that is, ba that, that is on human participants, uh, but, the, but the background research for that, for that research uh, is on other animals, especially chimpanzees and uh, canines and gorillas, thank you. Um, but I am not involved in any of that, so I cannot tell you much more than that. That's a really, I mean, it's a, it's a really important question to be asking because, um, because where does the line, where do we draw the line between humans and animals, right? And one of, one of the things that we like to say is that, one of the things that linguists often like to say is that you know, animals don't have language. Animals have communication, but they don't, we have this whole list of things that are required for something to be a language. And, and we'll go through and we'll say, well, they do these things, but not this. So it's not a language, right? But like, I don't know, what is, what is the purpose of that criteria, right? What is the purpose of saying that they don't have language? Um, yeah. It's a great question. I'm sorry. I feel like I don't have great answers for you guys. You guys have great questions for me that I don't have great answers to. I apologize. Yes? I know you work on phonetics and sounds, but I'm curious if any of this research has been applied to sign languages and if external factors might influence how signers perceive words or... Yes, 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 and yes. Yes, I did not talk about sign language at all uh, because I am nowhere near an expert in sign language. Um, well, not only my, uh, so the question was about sign language uh, and whether any of the work that I have talked about here uh, has been extended to sign language. And the answer to that is a resounding yes. So the coolest thing about sign language is that even though it comes from a completely different modality, right? Vision and gesture rather than speech and rather than audio and sound, right? The, the really cool thing about uh, the research that we have done with sign language is that exactly the same things can be studied for sign language. It's really, it's, it's really great stuff. Uh, and if you're, if you're interested in more, if you're interested in reading some more uh, work about sign language, um, we, well, if you're interested in learning more about sign language, anybody who's interested in taking a sign language class, we have a really fabulous lecturer uh, in our department uh, named Sherry Hicks. Uh, and she teaches our intro to sign language class and it's always full all the time and it's really fabulous. Uh, but also we've got several researchers in our department uh, like 
Eve Sweeter, who uh, runs the group on gesture and while like physical hand gesture. And so uh, while they don't always work on sign language, um, a lot of the work that they do and a lot of the work that they read is cross pollinated with with sign language. So yes, so sign language has exactly the same kinds of. Uh, in fact, we even call it phonetics and ph phonology, even though it's not sound. So the like, little pieces of the gestures that you put together into words uh, and where, where you put that gesture makes small differences in not necessarily the meaning of the word, but what you mean when you say that word or sign that word. It's really cool stuff. Great question. Yes? Um, I saw a graphic recently that, that said, I can't remember the percentage, but a lot of, a lot of languages extinction and I'm really happy that you brought that up. I'm wondering what what efforts to save languages from extinction look like because I I can't imagine like how somebody would go about doing that. Fabulous question. So the question is how do we save languages? Um, the answer is ultimately depressingly we can't. Um, how a language is saved is really up to the community who speaks it. Uh, and so it is not really ultimately up to us as linguists to say, you know, you guys, you were born to these parents who spoke this language and so like, we're gonna foist this responsibility onto you, right? So it's not, it's not something that we're really allowed to do. So all we can do as linguists is we can document these languages, we can provide people who want to learn these languages uh, the tools to learn the, the languages, to reconnect with the languages of their ancestors. That, that's all we can do, really. Um, but there have been some really amazing efforts towards doing this. So one of the things that I talked about earlier, of course, is uh, the fact that we have computers now and phones and all of this technology, right? And so uh, there are several um, there are several efforts in lots of different places. The one that I'm thinking about right now is focused in Australia, and I think there's another one focused in Africa, of distributing cell phones uh, capable of collecting speech, record, like speech recordings and doing other kinds of um, recording of morphological forms and stuff like that. And because these apps will communicate centrally to like a server, then we can collect all of this information in one place. And then it's not necessarily a linguist-led effort, it's actually led by the individuals in the community. So these individuals decide that they want to do something, that they want to communicate with each other and, uh, and document the language. We put the power in their hands. I say we, they put the power in their hands. Uh, I'm not involved in this project. But uh, yes, yeah, so, so again, it is not really up to us as linguists whether or not a language is to be saved, unfortunately. Um, all we can do is tell people how they can do it if they want to. Great question. Thank you. Yes? Do your students have to take an exam to see that they can distinguish phonemes? Because <laughs> how could you make a notebook if you're not very adept? That is a fantastic question. So the question is, how do people do field research if, they don't, if, they, if they're not able to recognize the difference between sounds? And the answer is, well, they can't. Um, and so we do our very level best to train our students to be able to hear the difference. And it takes quite a while. If, anybody have, and if any of you guys have, have been in an intro to phonetics class, like the first time you hear these sounds, you're like, that sounds just like that other sound that I just heard, right? Uh, and so um, going back in time, almost, almost a full century now, uh, the, the, um, the linguists in England where a lot of this stuff was being developed, they actually had extremely strict exams for all of their students. You had to train for, I think, up to around five years or so before you'd be allowed to uh, document languages before you'd be allowed to call yourself a phonetician. Um, and this would be a lot of uh, production, so can you produce the words, but also a lot of ear, what we call ear training. So um, can you hear the differences between these sounds and can you transcribe them accurately? So um, my, my training is, was a lot less rigid than that. Um, we, don't, we don't do things quite the same anymore. And one of the reasons that we don't put as much emphasis anymore on 
uh, on the ability of an individual to hear these differences is because we know that uh, we know that even then, even then, there are going to be differences that we can't really hear. And on top of that, we have this technology now that we can record most of the things that uh, most of the things that we're um, eliciting. So, if we have questions about why a native speaker of a language thought that these two words that sound identical to me are in fact different. We can actually go back and we can look at the acoustics and we can try to figure out what are the differences. Even if I can't hear them, maybe I can see them. And if I can see them, then maybe I can devise some kind of an experiment to test to see whether that's in fact the right, uh, that's the right distinction. Great question. So. Uh, another place where new technology can help us do some of the things that our brains and our ears are less well-equipped. I was going to say ill-equipped, that's not entirely true. Less well-equipped to do. Thank you. Yes? I think we have time for oh. one, one last question. Okay. One last question. Yes? Um, so the language is a product of, of history, of, of uh, culture, smells, tastes, what <laughs> How do we account for, sorry? The, the, the words, the, when we are capturing words, is any of that accounted for or considered in linguistics? How do we capture words? Cultural, cultural. The cultural history, oh. cultural richness. How do we Great, think, yes. You know, so let me, repeat my let me repeat your question back to you and let me see if I got it correctly. So your question is, you know, I've been going on and on about all, like, there's so many things that affect how we hear speech and so many things that go into language. And, uh, of course, going back to the octopus, octopi, uh, octopodes question, there's all of this history as well. You wouldn't know that it might be octopodes if you didn't know that that word was, uh, that word was Greek in origin, right? Um, so how much of that gets accounted for uh, when we study language, or how much of that gets accounted for when we learn languages? Which one of those is your question? When you study them. When you study languages. Um, it depends a lot on the kind of linguist who you are. So, for instance, as a phonetician, um, when, I, when I have my phonetician hat on, I care relatively little about where a language has come from. When I have my sound change hat on, I care a lot about where the language comes from. I care a lot about the history of that language, the other languages that that language is at, that the speakers of that language has interacted with, have interacted with, uh, talking about uh, pronoun agreement, right? Um, but of course, when, I'm a, when I have my phonetician hat on, when I'm, when I'm mostly interested in what people are doing today, I don't, I don't really care that much about what the history of that language is. So it really depends a lot on the kinds of questions that I'm trying to answer and whether or not the, whether or not the origin of that language, the experience of that language, the culture of that language matters is germane to that question, right? But that's a really great question because of course, right, and I think maybe I can leave you guys with this thought, right, that one of the reasons, one of the reasons why it's frustrating to be a linguist sometimes, but also really awesome to be a linguist most of the time, is that it's all around us, right? It's part of like, not just everyday life, but also our identities, right? And it's really awesome to be able to study something that is so important to virtually everybody you meet. The part of it that's frustrating, of course, is that you go to these dinner parties and somebody asks you, well, you know, French is the most beautiful language in the world, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> and they expect you to be able to say something like, definitive and qualitative about that. They'd expect you to be able to, uh, they expect you to be able to tell them why they're correct. <laughs> and again, what does a linguist want to do? The linguist wants to say, well, what's correct? <laughs> right? All right. I think that's it, right? All right. Thank you, Thank you guys so much for coming. Hi. Hi.